Well, welcome to everybody to my presentation this morning on healthy and resilient cities in the COVID-19 era. Before I begin, I would like to prof thank Professor Tang for all her assistance uh, with uh, the arrangements for this symposium. And in the time that I'm spending with you this morning, I would like to discuss effective responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, underlining that there are no simple solutions to this very complex problem which we face in our world today. Sorry. The outline and objectives of my talk this morning are to explain what we mean by healthy cities and healthy lifestyles, and to discuss the role of the built environment, in particular the urban environment, in public health and urban history. And we know now that for many, many centuries there's been links between our habitat and especially the cities in which we live our public health, and we need to understand these interrelationships. And then I'll explain three cornerstones of transdisciplinary responses to the coronavirus pandemic and COVID-19 disease. And I'm suggesting because we are faced with a complex societal challenge, we need to think differently uh, to the way that we have proceeded, especially with respect to urban planning, and my contribution can be considered in a broader context. So I would like for each of you to think about the complexity of the COVID-19 disease, but also how it relates to other complex societal challenges, such as climate change, such as the obesity pandemic, and other key uh, features of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. My presentation today will be through the lens and experience of human ecology and environmental sciences with a particular focus on urban health. And my focus will be explicitly interdisciplinary and indeed transdisciplinary. And I will explain the differences between these two concepts following 12 years of experience in my uh, role as a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences. Let me begin my presentation with the conceptual framework. So my perspective is coming from human ecology and here I present a diagram which is an ecosystemic model of the relationship between people, their immediate environment, and the country and the planet Earth in which we live. It is a people-centered conceptual framework. And I think what's really important when we're talking about challenges like COVID or the United Nations 2030 agenda, that we do have a people-centered approach. Now, whether you're in Japan or here in Geneva, each of us has a particular lifestyle, a, a community, a uh, set of social uh, networks and a local economy. And these are inscribed in the built environment, which is what the urban planners, architects and civil engineers provide for us. And our built environment is inscribed within the natural environment. And in fact, uh, we are totally dependent on that natural environment for our water, for our fresh air, and for many of the natural resources that we convert in the construction of buildings and indeed whole cities. And all of this is inscribed within a global system of climate, of biodiversity. And we need to think about the relationship between people and the globe across all of these nested interrelationship scales. And this is important whether we're talking about 
our response to COVID-19 or the other challenges of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And I'm suggesting to you that what we hear is a, is a systemic uh, set of multiple relationships between people and the natural environment. And we know that in the case of COVID-19, there's been a disruption. We have changed the habitat of the animal world. We have changed the biodiversity of the world, and we have created the problem that we've confronted with today in all regions of the world. And this is because we have had exponential population growth especially during the last 200 years. And we see that we've moved from a global population of 1 billion in 1804 to 7 billion in 2011. And as the population expands, the growth becomes increasingly important. But what is really also uh, required is that we don't just think about all the people in terms of numbers uh, here in terms of demographic growth. We think about the habitat that we're providing for these people. And we have to remember that not people, not everybody is benefiting from urban economic development. And in fact, one of the greatest challenges that we face in the world today is one of inequalities. And these inequalities are expressed in health and quality of life. And I'll be coming back to that in my presentation. Now let's look at some lessons from urban history about this relationship between urban planning, public health and urban history. And what can we learn from urban uh, history and public health? that we could think about using again today. As you saw, the city developed with rapid urbanization and industrialization from the 18th century, especially in Europe first, but then in to different degrees in all regions of the world. And that rapid demographic and industrial growth created um, an insanitary habitat. And already by the 1850s, in big cities like London and Paris, there was a real concern about contagion from infectious disease. Cholera and, for example, tuberculosis decimated populations in these cities. And uh, it was at that particular period in the last half of the 19th century that consortium of architects, civil engineers, doctors and politicians collaborated together to resolve the problem. And they largely resolved the problem of the insanitary city in the 19th century by concerted action and collaboration between disciplines and professions and with a strong political commitment. And I'm suggesting to you that that is what we need today if we are going to effectively respond to COVID-19. It's not just a medical problem. It's a societal challenge. And we need to have the collaboration of everybody, including uh, the local population. And I'll be coming back to that further in my talk. Why is housing, building and urban planning so important when we're talking about public health in general and not just the COVID disease. Well, um, research has shown since the 1980s that public health is not just a medical problem. So here we have the health status of a population. It could be the, the population in Tokyo or Geneva or a particular neighborhood of Tokyo and or Geneva. And conventionally, it was considered that the population or uh, um, health of a specific group depended on their personal biological characteristics and uh, their, for example, ADN, 
but also their living conditions and lifestyle and their access to affordable primary health care. But you can see from here that we're only talking about 50% of all the variables that the World Health Organization estimates contribute to health and quality of life. And we see that these, there are many other factors here that have, have to be factored in in order to understand the complexity and the multiple variables that are involved in determining health status of a particular population group. And apart from education and employment station and the role of information and political agendas, we have socioeconomic status, status and poverty, which is extremely important in cities. And we have the environmental factors. And that's where the urban planning here takes a particularly important role. And we see that WHO estimates that 25% of all variables are in fact related to the environment. And it can be the environment of our housing unit, of the residential neighborhood in which we live, of the city, but also at the regional and indeed the global level, climate change being an obvious example. So we can see that the built environment has an extremely important role to play, even more important than access to affordable primary health care. So it seems to me that architects, civil engineers and urban planners, amongst others, should be having courses about the importance of environmental factors in tandem with economic factors, political factors and other factors which influence our living conditions, our behaviour and our lifestyle and indeed the health and well-being of us all. And I just want to emphasise that we need to remember that it is so crucial not to forget the importance of these socio-economic and environmental factors, because we know today that over 50% of the world population are living in urbanised areas. We know that cities occupy 2 to 3% of the global land surface, but they consume at least 75% of all resources globally. They're using land, energy consumption, and create carbon footprints that are influenced by the characteristics of uh, the built environment. So for example, um, we know that the compact city will have a, a least strong environmental impact compared to the dispersed uh, city and suburban development. And we need to remember that urbanization is a key component of national development plans. So there are extremely important economic and political factors here that come into play. But we also know that the health risks are greater in urban areas compared with rural areas in high and middle income countries. And that we saw from the 19th century in the European city, as I recalled. And it is still evident today in European countries such as Denmark, where life expectancy at birth in Copenhagen is lower than the national average. This is not the case, however, in low income countries where um, the, the correlation is reversed. And last but not least, let's remember that we have specific groups of the population, such as children, the elderly, and women who spend more than 75% of their time indoors. So the indoor environment of our housing, our schools, our shopping centers and so forth are extremely important for our health and quality of life. Now, in order to move beyond the biomedical model of health and include the socioeconomic and the environmental factors, we need to think systemically. We need to think out of the box, as we say in English. And we need to think about the components of our habitat, which we create consciously in terms 
of the environment and security in terms of the local economy in terms of all the infrastructure and buildings and energy required to function our cities and how these are related to the aspirations, values and lifestyles of the local population and their health, well-being and quality of life. And we must remember that we can't just be looking at the built environment itself. We have to think about the different geopolitical levels, as I mentioned, from the scale of the individual building to the neighbourhood, to the city, to the country, to the region, to the globe. And we have to think about the temporal dimension. And again, that's where the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is so important because it was one of the first international programs back in the 1990s that talked about future generations, not just about current generations. And last but not least, we need to think about the cultural and institutional context so that the idea that is now being discussed about collaboration between Japan and China is extremely interesting to me because there are important institutional, cultural, political differences between these countries. And how are these reflected then in the built environment that we construct, the way we use it, and its impact on our health and quality of life? Now, in my work, I... Uh, have suggested there are key domains in which architects, urban planners, civil engineers, and all those professions involved with the built environment can make a significant contribution to health and quality of life. And <laughs> these are explained in my book, which was published recently by Routledge. And I will give you the explicit reference to this book at the end of my presentation. The book includes many examples about, first of all, housing and the need to provide housing that promotes health and well-being for diverse households, those with children, those that are single parents, the elderly that don't have home-based care. And there seems to be an enormous challenge here because in many countries around the world, neither the private nor the public sector has been able to provide attractive and affordable housing for people where they would like to live. The second domain is urban agriculture. And this is fascinating because the dichotomy between the country and the city created the dichotomy between the food that we eat from local farmers and that which is important. And we know today we have created this global agro-industrial food system, which would be very difficult to change. But we do see change, at least at the local level, with the introduction of locally produced food in many cities around the world, including New York, including London, including Paris. And this is a complete reversal of the trend of the global food market. Today, people want to know what they're eating. They want healthy food after numerous scandals about food consumption in European and Asian cities. The third domain, which is extremely important for urban planning is inclusive public spaces. We need to have public spaces that enable people to have healthy lifestyles, especially in response to densification of our cities, not just in Asia, but in all regions of the world and in a small country like Switzerland, being faced with densification, the first thing that uh, is deleted from the uh, urban plan is the green public space. And that is why WHO has had a program talking about access to green public space and making recommendations about uh, all households having access to green public space in our cities. The fourth domain is shifting from transport planning, which is based on road transport and especially providing uh, road, road networks and parking lots 
for private vehicles to other forms of mobility, including public transport networks and more active living, including cycling and walking. Many cities in our world today do not even have footpaths in which children can walk to school. They don't have cycling tracks, but these are now being introduced in, even in very dense cities like Copenhagen and Amsterdam, perhaps the two leading cities in the world, where the shift from transport planning to mobility has been significantly important in recent decades. And last but not least, we need to rethink the connections between built and natural environments, as I suggested from the conceptual framework, which I presented at the beginning of my presentation. We're not just talking about individual health or household health. We're talking about global health and planetary health. And we see this is critically important during this COVID pandemic. Now, I just want to come back to the example of the public green space, which really challenges this shift for densification. And um, one way of thinking about this is not to leave behind the either or logic of densification or public green space, and to talk about synergies created by different options and the co-benefits that can be provided by providing public green space uh, in our cities. <laughs> and the concept of public green space and its co-benefits goes back a long way, in fact. It goes back to Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities of Tomorrow from 1898. It goes back to this plan of the city of Adelaide in Australia, which created a parkland around a, a, a city centre, a central district, central district, district, and the planner said, "This is the lungs of the city." And here's a photo of that beautiful green space around the central business district of Adelaide. And when we think about the research that's being done in the last few decades, one understands that that kind of public green space. Uh, adjacent to a central uh, business district has co-benefits. The first is biological. It supports biodiversity and increased biodiversity uh, is promoting resilience and adaptability. But it also has um, monetary costs. Although the land is public, one no notes that the private properties around uh, the public green space have increased market value. And that is extremely important and uh, is proven by numerous studies in ecological economics. There are, of course, environmental. Uh, the trees and the green space absorb carbonic gases. They filter fine particulates and they influence ambient temperatures. And the whole question about um, the climate change here is extremely important uh, in that particular co-benefit. But we we'll also know that there are health benefits. Studies in Europe in which I've participated show that contact time of more than four hours per week for children and pregnant women in public green space is positive for their health and quality of life. And last but not least, we have the social dimension and we know that the public green space can be a meeting place uh, and I've seen elderly citizens in Chinese cities meeting each other in um, public green spaces or doing Tai Chi for example early in the morning. Ideal and corrective measures and we think of the Lisbon earthquake which demolished the um, center of the city in 1755 and had to be reconstructed and it was completely replanned differently to what it had been before the earthquake. 
I've mentioned the example of the public health movement in the 19th century city and how consortiums of uh, professionals and politicians worked together to intervene to sanitize the city that had been the source of contagion of infectious diseases. And uh, in a short moment, I'll be using the example of Antwerp in Belgium uh, as an example of a city with remedial and corrective measures. And tomorrow, think about how what uh, we're discussing here and now could be used in the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, in which we know we have SDG 3 on good health and well-being, and we have SDG 11 on sustainable cities and the relationships between the two are explicit. So let me use the example now of Singapore, which is described in detail in my book. Now, Singapore took independence in the 1950, late 1950s and by com political commitment, Lee Kuan Yew decided to create a major city from a small fishing port in Southeast Asia. And we find that 50, 60 years later, we have a major economic hub in Southeast Asia in which we have had rapid urban development, very strict land use plans, but at the same time, a conscious decision to protect uh, green space, biodiversity, access to uh, the waterfront. And this was all expressed in explicit land use plans, which have been developed and uh, ensured not only that green space is provided by public parks, but we have connectors between the parks creating biological corridors. And we have um, very interesting water catchment areas. So this is a conscious decision of how political commitment, creative urban planning come together to provide a healthy living environment for a rapidly urbanizing city in Southeast Asia. And the change, as you all know, has been significant. The second example is creating the dystopia. And I'm using the example from urban planning of um, the road and the infrastructure system for private cars uh, and motor vehicles, which was used to create many of our cities during the 20th century and which um, had many negative impacts, including increased car ownership, creating more accidents on the road, more demand for road parking, uh, increased impermeability of land surfaces and the likelihood of flash floods. But also the whole problem of adverse health effects from air pollution, uh, poor urban air quality and uh, carbon emissions, but also noise, congestion, and adverse economic impacts. What's really interesting is that this particular uh, domain has been proven extremely effective in terms of interventionist preventions with the pandemic, because we've seen that with lockdown or um, uh, confinement, road traffic has decreased and air quality has proved in many major cities, including those in the Asian region. Microclimatic effects are important. Biodiversity loss, property damage due to flash floods, air pollution, uh, vandalism, and other sources of damaged property uh, are create a range of costs that need to be taken into account. And last but not least, something we mentioned before, we've created a sedentary lifestyle in which we rely on the motor car rather than walking and cycling to move uh, on a daily basis. Now, given that, 
it's been very interesting to see that a local a group of residents in the city of Antwerp in Belgium, which is a major, the second major port in the whole of Europe, and therefore used much use of road traffic to transport goods and services to the port, um, have created an alternative project to official land use planning, which has um, embedded the road traffic underground and created public green space and water catchment areas in the city, um, thus improving the health and the quality of life of the local citizens. That was a, a very interesting community-led project in which the architects and the urban planners participated with uh, the uh, local population to create an alternative to the official plans of the authorities. So what these two examples suggest is that we are capable of change, that we are capable of explicitly modifying the relationship between the ecosystems in our natural world and all the resources that they provide for us and which we depend on, and our social system, including our legal arrangements, our land use plans, our local economy, um, our um, nutrition, our technology, our social organization. And this is the heart of resilience. If we have that capacity to adapt and change, then we do become a resilient society. And how we do it will mean whether the, our response is effective or not. And what is extremely important is that when we're talking about the COVID pandemic here, we have to think about the effectiveness of behavioral change at the individual group and the community level. We know that the social distancing works. We know that wearing masks work. We know that confinement, curfew and quarantine may be necessary, but whether they are um, adhered to by the local population uh, will determine whether we respond effectively to the COVID-19, which has been created by changes to the animal world and their habitat. So before I conclude, I want to move on now to come back to this problem of complexity and talk about COVID-19 and coronaviruses as a social problem, not just a medical problem, as I mentioned before. And I'm using the term wicked problem, which is borrowed from a wonderful article published 50 years ago almost by Rittel and Weber, who talked about the inability of public policies, especially in the urban planning area, to simplify and, and try to resolve very complex uh, issues in our world. And some of the characteristics of a wicked problem, such as COVID-19, are illustrated here. It's a complex unknown. There was no precedent. Yes, we did have SARS before, but COVID-19 is different. How can we learn from the past? And what do we need to know about an unknown that has no precedent? But perhaps one of the biggest challenges of COVID-19 is that it's emergent, it's dynamic, and it's unpredictable. And we have great difficulty in admitting the fact of unpredictability. So there are limits of forecasting and very uh, much concerns about uh, how we move forward dealing with an unknown which is unpredictable. And this means that we need to think in different temporal scales. The need for the short, the mid and long term responses is critically important. We need to think of multiple impacts, and we've talked about health, economic, environmental, political and social impacts. We need to think systemically, and we've talked about that. 
And we need to talk about the context. Although COVID is everywhere, how we respond to it in Japan uh, and in Tokyo or in Switzerland and in Geneva is quite different. And we need to think about agency, about combining public health interventions and medical treatments with other initiatives. And we need resources. We need the data, the information and the specialised knowledge, but that alone is not enough. We need to have hospital infrastructure, medical and pharmaceutical supplies, which have been in short supply in many cities and countries around the world. And we need uh, the, the health and uh, care of a welfare personnel. But above all, we need this creative creativity to create consortia with synergies between disciplinary expertise, professional knowledge, public policies, and human behavior in order to have effective responses. And that's why I'm talking about transdisciplinary responses. And the transdisciplinary responses are here, whereas the medical responses are here. So I just briefly want to say that here, we each one of these circles represents a discipline. And here it can be the biological uh, scientist, the medical professional, the virologist, the nursing staff, and so forth. And multidisciplinary means that they're working alongside each other to tackle the problem of the pandemic. Whereas interdisciplinarity means that they are explicitly collaborating with each other to define an effective response to the pandemic. And each of these is happening within academic and scientific knowledge domains. And here I've got an institutional border, sorry, an institutional border. And we need to go across that border to bring in other forms of knowledge cultures beyond these here, including the political commitment, the tacit knowledge and the experiential knowledge of local community populations in order to create a more compound and complex consortia of knowledge domains to deal with the pandemic. And that is why I make the distinction between interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary responses and why I'm arguing that the transdisciplinary responses are necessary. And they are illustrated by this particular diagram, which is suggesting that the specialized knowledge and know-how is here at the top. And of course, this is necessary for uh, responding to COVID, that we need the political commitment and, uh, in, and support so that the relationship between knowledge and political commitment along this axis is important but also the relationship between specialized knowledge and the local population is extremely important. And we cannot ignore the individual and collective behavioral beliefs and values of those in our cities. And of course here, there has to be trust between the society and the politicians. And together they form this compound domain, which I've explained in two articles, uh, that will define the transdisciplinary response to uh, COVID-19 and why transdisciplinary responses are extremely important. Now, this, this diagram has been illustrated by uh, political leadership and responsibility at both national and city levels in which we have a, uh, a variety of different responses, as well as different community adherence and responsibility to um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and that's why we can use this diagram to understand that when we're talking about the diversity of transdisciplinary contributions, we talk about convergence, developing a common vision, and then implementing it to respond effectively to the pandemic. 
So we need to understand what are our concerns, what do we know, what do we want, how do we achieve this, with what resources, how, when, where, and then we monitor and feedback. And in fact, I'm suggesting to you that there are three broad category of cases that define these different responses to um, COVID-19. The first is what I call zero COVID-19. And we've got the example of Taiwan or New Zealand, for example, in which very strong political leadership based on scientific knowledge will determine interventions to stop COVID-19 at the outset. The second is living with COVID. And that's uh, an option that was used in Sweden and some other European countries. And it's based on compromise so that our concerns will be not just with containing COVID, but enabling people to lead a life which may be controlled and may be limited in certain ways, but uh, we will certainly not have complete lockdown um, or curfew. And the third is just denial. And here we have the examples of Brazil and Tanzania with the dire consequences uh, involved by denial. So we can see that there are no simple solutions to a wicked problem like COVID-19. And that's why, I'm, before I conclude, I just want to say that in urban planning, we have to start to think about complexity. We have to think in terms of systemic relationships between multiple variables. So that when we're talking about um, urban planning in the post COVID-19 area, we have to reject inflexible quantitative norms and professional guidelines so that the amount of green space per capita, for example, is, is not an effective response to the human needs and values of people in different cities in the world that have different lifestyles, value systems, and so forth. And so, as Albert Einstein explained, we need to think differently. We cannot resolve the problems that we've created using the same thinking that created them. And that's precisely the situation that we face today with COVID-19 and with implementing the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development. Before concluding, I'm indicating two key references here. The first two are explicitly about um, transdisciplinary responses to COVID-19. The third uh, is the complete reference to my new book, Creating Built Environments, Bridging Knowledge and Practice Divides. And then you've got the reference here to Rittel and Weber. So here is the cover of my book. And you also have access to my two blogs, uh, which are discussing some of the challenges of developing these consortia to do with complex and wicked problems in our contemporary world. I would like to thank you all for your attention and my best wishes to you for a very interesting 